Hello, good morning, and welcome to the International Plant Breeding Seminar Series. This is our last seminar for this uh, series of 2023, the fall of 2023. Uh, we have the pleasure today of having Dr. Hamid Kasai from the Natural Resource Institute in Finland and the University of Helsinki, talking about advances in phoba bean breeding and genomics. Uh, Dr. Kase did his master's at the university uh, at uh, Shah Rekord University in Iran, doing his thesis at CIMIT in Mexico. Uh, he then, uh, that was a master's in plant breeding, and then did a, a PhD in crop science and plant breeding from the University of Helsinki. Uh, then he went on to uh, work as a postdoctoral fellow and then a research fellow at the University of Saskatchewan. He worked for uh, a bit more than a year as a, a tomato breeder at the World Vegetable Center, then to return to um, Finland to work as a, um, right now as an asso assist associate professor in plant genomics and breeding and being part of the Natural Resource Institute in Finland. Uh, Hamid has served as a scientist, educator, and applied breeding in Asia, Europe, Africa, and North America. He is passionate about legume breeding and genomics as tools to improve global protein security. Hamid, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to have you with us, and uh, I will stop sharing here to give you the floor. Go ahead. Thank you, Carlos, for the nice introduction. Yes, it's my pleasure. Uh, to be here. Thank you very much for your invitation. Yeah, I'm always happy to talk about faba bean. You know, faba bean is my pet plant. So yeah, lovely crop. Yeah, let's, okay. So the today, uh, my today's seminar title is advanced, I mean, new advance, advancements in faba bean breeding and genomics. So I just go for about 40, 45 minutes. I wish I could talk more, but anyway, if you have questions, you can always contact me. You can easily find me. Yes, so today I'm going to talk about the importance of the faba bean in cropping system, food and feed systems. Of course, we talk about the faba bean cultivation challenges or oh, other issues because this crop is kind of linked to many, I mean, uh, seed quality issues, but we were lucky we could just tackle all the issues. I will explain in the next few slides. Then I will talk a little bit about the faba bean breeding challenges and then uh, the genomic, uh, genomics assisted breeding advancement we had already. And then I will talk a little bit uh, just about the recent faba bean genome that we released. Actually, I was part of the team. Uh, and it was led by Aarhus University, Professor Stig Anderson. And also I will talk a little bit about the faba bean pan genome because when you have the genome, you expand it to the pan genome. So yeah, I kind of try to cover everything, but anyway, in a small scale. Yeah, let's see. Okay, so just some basics about faba bean or Vicia faba. So the, the interest in this crop is because each seeds are very rich source of protein. So you can get almost 30% I mean, protein I mean, per seed dry matter, which is pretty high. I mean, high quality protein, very nice protein profile. I'm not going to talk about that. You get a lot of good minerals and nutrients from the seed. And the crop has a huge yield potential, which is not seen, unfortunately. I will also talk a bit. You can get almost something like 10 tons per hectare. I'm not talking about bushels, so let's just talk more. And I'm Europe, so it's just about the tons. Tons per hectare, more international metric, you know. Uh, yeah. And then it can be grown all the way from up here from Finland, I mean, 60 to north, degree north, to down to, uh, I mean, New Zealand. Uh, so that's kind of a crop for the world, but is not really seen. What makes uh, faba bean a perfect legume crop? Of course, you know, most of the legume crops can fix nitrogen. I mean, atmospheric nitrogen uh, from atmosphere to the soil, but faba bean is one of the most, I mean, efficient nitrogen fixer crop. That's perfect, you know. It can, we did some studies, uh, I just hear, we had a, a nice master student, uh, she did the perfect study, and then we showed that even faba bean can fix about 200 kilograms or 250 kilograms nitrogen per hectare. This is amazing, you know. Uh, the NDFA nitrogen drive from atmosphere is about 88%, which is, I mean, highest, at least among the cool season, I mean, grain legumes. Prob probably PGMP is a little bit less, but still fabobin can be, depending where and what genotype, I mean, G by E. Yeah. There are many factors, you all know. Yeah. 
So then why really Fababin is a highlighted crop now? I mean, in Europe, everywhere, I think that's coming a very fashion crop. So there is a high demand for the nitrogen fertilizer, I mean, chemical nitrogen fertilizer. And then we believe Fababin can really fill that gap. I mean, especially if you're looking for sustainable, I mean, domestic protein source for feed and food, which is a policy of many, I mean, European countries, you know, to be independent from soybean mills or seeds coming from South America or United States, sorry. Yeah, so we want to be more independent. We want to have our own protein here. I mean, plant-based protein. So and partly is because we want to avoid the greenhouse gas emission, which because, you know, I think I, I'm not explaining about uh, these, I mean, land use changes in South America and Brazil to destroy all the rainforest, make it to soybean. And even soybean is a legume crop, but still they use nitrogen to get more. And so that's creating a lot of global issues. And also that the other problem we see here, that's transportation. I mean, coming to over Europe from US or South America. So again, the gas emission. So, I mean, we're looking for green energy, green crops. That's the policy for the European Union. And also there's a high demand, I mean, that's globally, uh, for plant-based proteins like Beyond Meat, uh, I mean, products, which is probably the perfect, you know, candidate. Uh, peas is partially doing this job, but the problem is peas are having many problems. For example, when you go up north to Canada, root rot, you know, often just destroying many fields. And even here in Finland, we have, but the, the, the many places that peas cannot be the right crop, probably can be easily grown. Uh, and even for soybeans, if you come to the north, probably we, are, we, have, we have nothing against soybeans. Soybean is a lovely crop. But the, the thing is, we don't want a soybean it comes in that, you know, <laughs> way. So, yeah. But in north, we really cannot grow. We don't have very good adapted lines. Of course, we, uh, we are working on that. But we have an easy crop. I mean, fantastic crop. So to work with. Yes, I want to just show this is very nice, uh, nice graphs. Just some figures here. So uh, as you can see, the nitrogen consumption in global food system is just trending upward and upward. The last 60 years, we see it has been a huge, you know, changes, you know, about uh, four times, you know, fourfold. And uh, you see half of this animal protein consumption is because of uh, changing in a diet. I think simply we're eating more meat more. And the other half, of course, is because of the I mean, in population increase, I mean, globally. And uh, to meet these needs, we have to produce uh, more crops, I mean, more protein crops. And then about three quarters of the protein crops we produce, it's just going for the animal fat, going for livestock. So that's a huge number. So uh, depending on what animal we're talking, so that's not very energy efficient. So that the, the, that protein can be directly actually Used for fooding, you know, I mean, for feeding a huge population. So, yeah, so the other main concerns that we think that fabobin is a perfect candidate crop uh, to fill that gap. But fabobin has its own problems. So, there's always problems everywhere, you know. So, you know, the first problem we have with this crop, or at least not, not much more, but still, fabobin still has an orphan crop. Has been little investments. And we are a small community working on the crop. What strong community though, very strong, very, we are very well connected. I mean, over Europe, all over the world. Uh, very nice group of people. Yeah, I, I can explain. Yeah, but still, uh, still funding is a challenge. However, the government EU is just it's changing. We are very happy we're getting more funding for this crop because you know, most of the funding always goes for the bigger crops. This is a problem when you work with a minor crop. But Fababin is not minor crop in many other countries actually anymore. So Fababin doesn't like drought, heat, or soil as it did like uh, maybe many other crops. So, but Fababin is very sensitive to drought. I will explain. We have always problem with actually yield instability. The yields are not very stable. We have some disease and pests. And also genomic and genomics and breeding is a bit less advanced compared to other grain legumes, which again, we had a very significant progress. Yeah. So let's talk about problems first. So the first problem I wanna highlight here is droughts. So there is no doubt among any cool season, especially grain legumes. I mean, Fabobin is the most sensitive to droughts. So Fabobin, I mean, requires, uh, a bit cool and moist growing season. So I have here some examples from Saskatchewan. Here in the picture in the left, you see 
the same cultivars grown at the same time. I think it was 2016, I believe. So in the left, that's a dry environment in South Saskatchewan with the border of the United States. You see the crop, how it looks, no irrigation, no rain. And here we have output, where we have the irrigation, probably irrigated fava bean. Uh, that's where we get 10 tons of fava bean per hectare. So you see how fava bean is responsive to irrigation and rain. So the crop needs a lot of water somehow. So, maybe I'm wrong, but it needs some amount of water. Let's say, I don't want to say it's like alfalfa or no, but yeah, it's responsive to irrigation uh, or, I mean, rain. So when talking about the biotic stresses, I think chuck spot, botrytis, on account by botrytis, that's the most, I mean, worldwide important disease for fava bean fungal disease. So it mostly happens when you have about high humidity, relative humidity, 95%, and temperature is about 20, 23, I mean, degrees centigrade. Uh, we have some sources uh, which are mostly partial resistant. So that's a challenge right now. That's actually the most important challenge we're facing, but we have solutions for that. I will show you. So the other diseases, when you go to Australia a little, a little bit more dry, you will have problem with ascochyta blight or rust. Uh, if it's there, they can cause problems. So when I was in Saskatchewan, we used to get a lot of aphids coming by wind from the United States. Uh, we get a problem with leaf or seed weevils, uh, but still they're not huge problems. So if I really want to summarize the two major killers of fava bean, I mean, cultivations, just talking about the agronomy, I mean, equally important are dry and heat, I mean, drought, or whenever you have the cool and humid climate, always chocolate pot crops. So that's how we get in a row here, for example, in Finland. When the summer, this summer was pretty dry and hot. So we had problems, severe droughts. So fava bean yields were very low. And some years, I mean, maybe next year, it's going to be very cool and humid. Then the chocolate spot comes. So that's a breeder's challenge. You know, you have to make kind of really work on multi, uh, multi traits. Now, that's what we are trying to do. So we are bringing more diversity. I try to explain part of that here. So this 45 minutes is not long. But anyway, I try my best. So let's about this historical issue with fava bean. I think all probably some of you heard about this Weising on Weising. I'm just talking about anti-nutrients problems in fava bean. So I will talk a little bit about that. This is the main actually uh, anti-nutrients limits the fava bean usage. That's why actually fava bean in many cultures it's uh, is known as a poisonous crop because this Weising on Weising can really kill people. I will show in the next slide. That's in seed catalogy. Also, we have problem with seed, uh, I mean, seed coat tannins, conduct tannins, which are in the seed coat. Seed coat is easy. You can get rid of that through the processing. But Weissing con Weissing, even when you do dry or wet fractioning, protein fractioning, Weissing con Weissing always sticks with the, the protein. That was a huge problem we had. Yeah, and then like any other legumes we have with protease inhibitors or oligosaccharides like raffinose, I think that's a very common problem uh, with most of the legumes, even with the beans. Uh, and also the other uh, issue we are working on, my colleagues, Professor Alan Schulman and Fred Studart working on, they're working to get rid of this beany flavor because fava bean, some, most of the lives have kind of this beany flavor, which is not really good for some cleaner uh, or some, uh, you know, food markets. So the way is that we are actually uh, looking at everything at this time. So we have several comprehensive projects try to tackle all the issues around. So let's talk about this Weising on Weising, kind of a historical issue with this crop. Kind of, the, I think that was the main reason limits uh, fava bean, I mean, production. So here you can see an illustration from Pythagoras. Uh, Pythagoras uh, showing and uh, asking, his, uh, I mean, himself and actually people following him to avoid fava beans, because even in that time, they kind of knew that this fava bean uh, can cause favism. You may have the body disease, fabism. It happens with the individuals with actually that deficiency in glucose 6 phosphate dehydrogenase, G6PD, which is about that's kind of sex linked, uh, chromosome X linked. Uh, and it's about 400 million individuals. So it can be severe actually damage to some people. 
you see it happens mostly in Africa, in the Middle East, Southern Asia, and South America, we have some reports. And don't forget so many immigrants coming all over the world, the US, Canada, Australia. So we see uh, this is something for, I think, a few years back, 2008, actually, more than a few years. But anyway, so I would say that's a global issue when you get immigrants coming all over the world. So if you want to use it for, I mean, school fooding, then you have to make sure, you know, if you have a good source of protein, you don't want to kill anybody. You know? uh, so that was the first thing when I was introduced to this crop. That was the first problem we decided to solve. So I will explain the, how we solve the problem. I think the other issue with the, I mean, seed quality is the tannins. I think tannins, uh, I think are mostly problems with the animals, not really causing an issue with human, uh, mostly with uh, protein digestibility. Uh, as I mentioned, is in the seed coat. You can easily remove the seed coat. But then we, we know that very simple. That's two com uh, I mean, complementary recessive genes called ZT1 and ZT2 controls the absence of the genes that actually are linked or determined by the white flower. So in Fababin, you may get this white flower. So whenever you see fully white flower, it means it's tannin free. So that's simple. That's an easy marker. Oh, of course, we have different I mean, morphological or the um, DNA markers, but this is white flower means simply, sorry, not zero tannin, low tannin. Still, you may get some in the seed coat. And this is the wild type in the top one. So when you see, we call it spotted or wild type flower. This is tannin. It, there might be some variation in the tannin content. So that's simple. So uh, because they're simple, I mean, just single gene, so easily you can breed for uh, I mean, low tannin lines, but anyway, this white flower is often uh, linked to bad agronomical practices. I mean, agronomical traits like, uh, I mean, disease susceptibility. So we have noticed almost that there, there is a link. We know that. So actually, we're working on that because the genes are on chromosome one and the very kind of in this one tiny region of chromosome one, which is hosting all these genes for tannins, uh, I mean, the check spot and route. So uh, that's, we have some difficulties to break the linkage, but we hope the CRISPR, we get all working in Europe and then fix the problem. But that's not a very difficult target, but Weissink on Weissink, definitely more complicated. So uh, before going to the solution, I want to just talk a little bit about this Fababin breeding challenges. So we are facing three main challenges. So first of all, you may hear heard, Fababin has a huge, gigantic genome. It's about 13 gigabase per, four times even larger than human genome. Many times, oh, 150, I think, 50 uh, times larger than Arabidopsis, a model plant species, or three, four times larger than peas. So that's why everything was uh, a bit more challenging. It shouldn't, I mean, affect on the crop itself, but because we didn't have genomic resources, then we couldn't really have, we didn't have a good marker system because we didn't have enough genomic resources. Uh, it doesn't have, of course, directly impact on the breeding, but I mean, uh, we need molecular markers. Uh, without molecular markers, we're like blind people in the field, you know. That's how I describe to many of my colleagues. So molecular markers are excellent tools these days. So here even I'm showing uh, that here, for example, you see this Fababin chromosome 1, this huge, huge, huge. Actually, only Fabobin chromosome one is as large as the whole human genome. And imagine how much work is put on human genome. So this is just one. I, I want to show you how big genome we are talking. Uh, I mean, it's, that's an amazing crop, you know. So the other problem we have, this is mostly with breeders, this mixed breeding system. So Fabobin is partially cross-pollinated. It can vary from 4 to 84 percent, depending on the genotype, I mean, the climate, uh, and the population of the, I mean, insects. So that's why we always work in insulation, I mean, bee-proof insulation. So we have, we can have smaller, depending on what the breeding target. So that's a bit costly for us, to be honest, uh, all, all over the world. And then we have no, any known Fabobin wild I mean, wild-related that's funny, nothing, we don't know. There have been a lot of research. There are some uh, species, I think from Visia, they may look some morphological similarities with Fababin, but no, 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 no. We have no idea about the wild relatives. They're lost, they're vanished, or they may not even existing. That's what I'm talking about, that because I was acting as a tomato breeder for some time, and I learned oh, how much the wild species of tomato were kind of giving to the tomato, we are coming to your, you know, your food or your table. 
So without wild species, I think we never could have these tasty, not probably not tasty, but good looking tomatoes, you know, in our table, at dinner tables. Anyway, so yeah, I think uh, that's something uh, in many crops, I think crop wild species are important. You know, we can get a lot of adaptive, adaptive genes. Okay, now let's go to a little bit to the advanced, but I'm, I hope I'm not going very quick, but only 40, 45 minutes. So I'm just going to share here with you the story of DNA marker uh, you know, discovery for y sync on y -Sync. V stands for y sync on y -Sync. So when I was a PhD student in 2015, we have developed a mapping population, ILB9382 uh, by Melody. Then we have noticed that one of the parental lines are low in y sync on y -Sync. Uh, And then we knew that the population is segregating. So we did a quick mapping. We got the few, I mean, the first generation of SNP markers in that time for Fawabin, of course. Fawabin is always behind minor crop, orphan crop. And then, yeah, uh, we found a huge QTL. You see here, at about explaining about 80, 90%. And, you know, uh, the, 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 the distribution frequency was by model. So we knew we are most likely dealing with one single gene, which is what's good, but still some part of variation was missing. We know what's the problem and what was the issue now, but anyway. Then we mapped it and it was about 10 centim gone uh, from this white hyalium. So we, but uh, we knew that maybe some of the white hyaliums are low wising, but then we know that no, uh, there's no any, because 10 centimeter still is a big gap. Uh, not any, not all the white hyalium, baba beans are low wising, con wising. But anyway, it was in that time, that was assumption that is close enough, 10 centimeter gun. But no, we know that's not the case anymore. Then anyway, we had the map. We used this, uh, we get, uh, in two years, we got more tools. We got these transcriptomes and also gene-based comparative mapping, which helped us actually to develop a cast marker. You can see in the right. What we love about the cast markers is you can find the heads. And then uh, this cast marker, uh, because we narrowed down the, I mean, the region helped us actually to find the candidate genes. So when we had the candidate genes, actually it helped us to uncover the voicing pathway. We actually did a big, huge team. We published it in Nature Plants. I think it was two years ago, one year ago. I don't remember, two years ago, probably. Yeah, I cannot see it from here. Yeah, so that was perfect news for us. So we had a marker, a reliable marker. We have a good gem plus and with low voicing, con voicing. Still, we get a little bit, but uh, uh, I cannot comment anything here. <laughs> but it shouldn't harm anybody if it goes actually to, as a, portion at the part of the bigger food. Uh, and then also we were actually very active to develop the markers for low YC, I mean, so low tannins, the two ZT1, ZT2. Actually, we developed marker for both, one for ZT1, one for ZT2. ZT2 is less used in the breeding programs. We don't know why. Nobody's interested in that gene. Somehow everybody was happy with the ZT1, maybe the order. Uh, and then, yeah, and then, but my colleagues in Spain, Professor Anna Maria Trost, they have done a fantastic job in this, the pathway, and you know, very advanced now. The problem with the tannins uh, is the seed darkening. And the most, uh, more, I think, uh, most likely, if you are growing white flower with low tannin varieties, you will get something like this, very black seed, which is, market is not accepted, even for animal feed. But then also we found a solution for this, so you can see here, we see variation. We saw we understood that uh, kind of uh, we when we go for lighter, I mean pot color, then we can get rid of this dark. So there is a linkage. We don't know what's the genetics behind. Uh, we are going to work on that soon if the funding comes. But that's very interesting. To how even pot color can you know influence uh, the, the, the seed coat color or seed to seed darkening. You know this is very bad trait. Uh, that's why not many farmers are willing to grow low tannins. There's a big market, but then this, yeah. Uh, so well, talking about drought, you know, I'm, I did a lot of work on drought. If my master and PhD were all about drought adaptation for different crops. So yeah, we had several projects uh, working on drought. The same population we developed actually was segregating for many traits, mostly shoot traits, stomata and transpiration. So we did several mapping, several phenotyping approaches. Uh, and then, yeah, we have a handful of candidate genes for these traits. But anyway, no, drought has a complex trait. So the small, small QTLs 
but uh, we're getting very good progress there too. Uh, yeah, so the way actually we are seeing the problem now because uh, we see many different germplasm of fababin. So we have some germplasm like this melody, which, which is a European line, uh, which is a kind of very efficient, uh, has a very efficient water sufficiency, uh, but under drought is not very productive because it's shut the stomata closed and very poor root system. We have this ILB non triate is coming from Colombia and Ecuador, from the border of Colombia and Ecuador. Most likely Spanish settlers took it to South America 500 years ago. So that's a tiny crop, but it's a very drought, drought, drought adapted. So that's very yield resistant. So, so it, it, it keeps a small body, whatever, small crop, so very efficient. So, uh, but anyway, the yield is very low. And also we have some lines from Syria, which have a perfect root system. So we are thinking that the idea type we are making now, we're making the crosses is to get something good from I mean, above ground and uh, combined with below ground. So that's a project I'm um, actually personally, I'm very interested, I'm very on it because that's my passion. I've been working on this for many years. And here actually the way we are doing them, it does have simple fork cross, but we are making all the funnel crosses. We wanted to do the eight way cross, but we see no reason to do that. Uh, for at this time, yeah, but we're doing that in collaboration with some breeding companies, and then we hope we get a, uh, something with very good rooting uh, and shooting system. I mean, cope with the drought and high productivity under drought conditions. I mean, either at uh, terminal drought or early droughts. Uh, yeah. So let's just move on to chuck spot botrytis. Another big issue with this crop. So again, we did mapping, uh, we did linkage mapping and actually association mapping. And we found some very nice picks, very good picks on chromosome one of Fababin, which we are very happy with now. We're doing some comparative genomics actually with, because uh, the botrytis is a problem in many different crop species. Strawberry is a economical crop here, even Arabidopsis. Uh, we're trying to do getting some information and then just push this project ahead. Uh, but the only problem we have is we get all, always partial resistance to this disease. Uh, so the steps we are doing is first we want to understand the I mean pathogen, I mean botrytis plant interaction, which is very important because we have different species of uh, botrytis. Then we are developing a magic population because we need to pyramid the genes. We have sources, secret sources, <laughs> from China, Ecuador, Spain, and North Africa. Uh, actually, I'm showing here, I changed the names, sorry, uh, because still confidential. So we did high throughput genotyping, we spit genotyping, and we, 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 uh, we did phenotype many rounds and genotype, and we are very confident we have different sources. Uh, of, uh, I mean, partial resistance from China, North Africa, one from ILB's gene, and also one from coming from Spain. Uh, yeah, so that's a very good news. We are going just, I'm going to start initiate the crosses this week, even plants are flowering in the greenhouse. I just check them today. Yeah, all good. So let's go to the other breeding goals. Oh, I said breeding goals. Sorry, the bee is dropping here. I just didn't, but anyway, so you know that that's breeding goals. Okay, look at this gorgeous picture. See the huge genetic diversity or phenotypic diversity for the seed size, shape, and I mean, color and fob seeds. You can get as tiny as these seeds, very tiny seeds, and as huge of these seeds, which uh, that's amazing. Why even we don't, we need a wild species, you know, we have perfect gene pool, you know, uh, for many traits, you know, we have no wild species, but we have perfect diversity within this crop. All and all crossable. So the way we see it, uh, I, I, the, let me just push this to the right. Okay, the smaller seed size mostly actually uses for, uh, we, we want them small seeds because there are many pea breeders, I mean pea growers that they would like grow for them. So we were looking something that works with the existing missionary. So we have it. So people growing peas, having problem with pea, growing peas with diseases, no, they can easily replace it with fababi. Or the protein industry, which is thirsty for new products, which is, I mean, new crops like fababi, high protein. 
even I think by growing faba, you can get almost the highest protein per hectare compared to any other crops. And the large seeded ones, uh, like these, going as a vegetable type. We have a breeding program for the vegetable type. So, and here we know a lot actually about the faba beans, I mean, uh, seed size genetics. So this is what I did when I was a student, 2014. We found QTLs on chromosome four. And then in a recently paper we published also, we found the same peaks, chromosome four. So, so we have huge, I mean, good QTL sitting there. So we can adjust the, uh, you know, the seed size in faba bean, I mean, identically, easily now. So yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, that was a small crop, but that was a huge stream in the last five, 10 years. So we're going super fast, you know, in this crop because of the protein crisis, you know, across the world. And look at this beautiful picture. Oh my God. So here you see, this is the yellow pea in the left and this is yellow fava bean. Do you see any difference? Very similar. Here you can see the green pea and here in the right side, you see the green fava bean. So the pea industry, Pea growers, pea lovers, welcome to use the faba beans. Uh, higher yields. And here actually is the train, how we just from very huge seed size uh, going to the surround. So the source for the round, I mean, round faba beans coming from Afghanistan. So interesting. So many gem plasm coming from Afghanistan, they have these round seeds. So I think any breeding program gets that from Afghanistan. Uh, yeah, so and that's why I wanted to talk some about the, this, uh, Faba bean seed size, because I know that's a question uh, for many people across the world, even here, many of our new colleagues, because you see again here, huge, huge genetic diversity. I mean, phenotypic diversity for the seed size. And here you can see some vegetable type faba beans. I just took it from my neighborhood in Helsinki. So in Europe, people love to grow, especially British people. You go to, go to Britain, go to UK, oh, in every back, people in the backyards, all growing this vegetable faba beans. They use it in fresh in salad or eat it or just boil it. There are many different ways. So if, just if you pay for a trip to UK, you will see a lot of faba beans in the backyard. So even it's very getting very common here too. So it's mm, nice, I mean, fresh, healthy snack and good for backyard soil, you know, can fix nitrogen and then, yeah. So that, that's what we see. So we don't also see everything in a huge field. We want to make sure also people, every, every citizen get benefits out of this crop. And just, I want to talk also a little bit about the flower colors because also we have a huge flower color. We did a lot of nice work on the flower color diversity in the left top here. You see that's a wild type spotted flower. Then also you can see this mutant yellow spotted one. This is a beautiful one too. And of course you see the full white, which is low tanny. And you can see the red crimson, very common, or the brown. So these are the main color you can get, I mean, from many different gene banks or even from Amazon. Some of them, you may find these crimson red seeds. Amazon, USA, Canada, they have it, I'm pretty sure. Uh, and then we did many crosses when I was in Saskatchewan. And then you see all these new beautiful flowers. We did a lot of uh, biochemistry work published in Heart Science. Actually, not the biochemistry, in a different paper, just came out a few months ago, but this was about the genetics of the flower color. Somebody's interested in publishing Heart Science with Jessa. Perfect job, she did perfect job. And again, look at this picture. I kind of used this picture in the first slide. I just want to show you the diversity in flower colors. So this is kind of the white type, and then you can get red, kind of bluish, purple bluish. Uh, this 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 is a beautiful color. That's a mutant never seen. Actually, that's a probably I was the first person had the opportunity to, to grow it. So that's what I'm saying. There's a huge diversity for the seed, for the flower, all in high protein. They can be safe. We know how to get rid of the Weissing from Weissing. That's a single gene almost. Yeah. So that's uh, we're trying to make a different combinations that kind of to push this crop as a vegetable crop. So. Uh, we think if people are going to grow it in the backyards, let's have it with a yellow flower, blue flower, so come, some attraction. So it's kind of edible garden, you know, edible, vivid edible garden, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, so uh, that's why we put a lot of effort on the flower color. So, and I was really lucky, you know, when I got to Helsinki, uh, there's a very kind of famous 
Fibobin mutation collections made by John Shrojadin. There are so many papers published. Uh, the collection is actually held in uh, Nurchin in Sweden. Uh, and then we are all good colleagues. I contact them. They had only one seed for a few of them. I said, could you please send me the seeds? I want to just grow genotype and then work with them. And so see. And fabulous, you know, mutations. This is the pea, pea pot. We call it pea pot. It, the pot looks like the pea. Different colors, this different hyalurea mutation. Even this one looks 100% like we, we have an even tinier one. It's like beans. I mean, fasolus beans is fava bean, but it looks like fasolus beans. We have the ma ma male trial, which can be used for hybrid beans, which is a big shortcoming. Yeah, all different kinds of combinations uh, I found in that collection. And even the unifoliates. So I, I love this unifoliate. So you see this all this compound leaves just become to huge leaf. And I have some pictures here. So I made red unifoliate combinations actually. It's growing in a greenhouse. Now beautiful, you know, you said big, big cluster of lead flowers, one single stem just putting up. Yeah, so yeah, so uh, uh, that was fun. That's not something new, of course. It has been reported before, but uh, the seeds were not available for many breeders or many researchers across the world. They vanished, you know, after the Second World War, most of the gem blossom. Yeah, and I did some, that's preliminary results, some genetic studies on, based on just very few lines, and I could say they nicely separate based on the DNA work, based on the seed coat color. Uh, I mean, purplish kind of ones here. Black ones there, beige ones there, and the flower color, but still preliminary results. And Primus is the background line that they use for making this mutation many years ago. And I could even get seeds from Primus and say something in between. They're very interesting results. So I, this is just a preliminary. Yeah, and then, yeah, just, just let's move on a little bit uh, to the genome side. Yeah, just uh, this year, that was a huge work by a huge team led by Stig Anderson, Musaf Urhus, we published the Fababin genome in Nature. That was a big thing, all happy about that two, three months ago. Yeah, I'm just going to talk a little bit, very kind of highlights about the Fababin genome. Uh, because Fababin genome is just fabulous, again, like a huge genome, but you will see, it's very different from any other crops. So here I'm just showing you only the chromosome one. I cannot bring all the six chromosomes here. Uh, and then talking about, uh, you know, uh, as you see here, the recombination rate is very uniform across, and here is centromere here in the middle. The recombination rate is very uniform you know, across the chromosome. The same with the gene density, uh, or even with, uh, with the TEs, you know, tra transposon elements, literal transposons, everything very uniform, you know, across the chromosome one, except there, the places you have the satellite arrays, DNA arrays, which is normal. Uh, and also we noticed that the uh, Fababin genome is highly, highly like other legumes, methylated. 95% of the seeds were kind of, uh, cytosthenins were itomethylated. It's huge, very huge actually compared to anyway. But if you just compare to the peas, probably no. But so then that actually this is, very clearly showing that the Fababin genome organization is very different from the other crops. For example, here I have barley in the left and Arabitopsis in the right. When you see the centromic area in any other crops, you see the, the green one is the gene diversity and the purple one is the recombination rates. You see, in the centromic area, you have much less uh, genes and recombination happens. So imagine you are a breeder, you have a trait of interest sitting somewhere here. You're working with Bali. How do you want to get rid of that? How do you want to break that? Interest? No, no way. Uh, that's why we found forward being very interesting. Part. Even the same in Arabidopsis. In the central area, I see the blue areas. Uh, you know, uh, gene diversity is very low. But when you go to distal, I mean, distances, the gene diversity increases. But back to forward making all the way. So it doesn't matter the gene of interest is in. I mean, central, no problem. You can break it with linkage. You need just to make more, I mean, make a bigger, larger population probably. So they're actually working that. We're trying to make different populations, different sizes for different traits. So in that way, Fobobin genome, amazing. Very different from any other crops. And which I love is here, actually. What I love is here. So if you have at least transposon elements, 
Here you see that's from one heading. That's one of the German cultivars uh, sequenced. I mean, full sequenced, fully sequenced. See, about eight, about ninety percent of the genome is repeats. <laughs> so ninety percent of the Favorin genome about repeat, repeat, repeat. What the crop needs to do that many repeats? We don't know. We really don't know the solution. That's that's probably why the crop could survive across thousands of the years. You know. So if we uh, look at this. Uh, LT retransposon, you see even Oge, Orge, is about make up about half of the genome. Similar to a, a little bit to the piece, but still a lot of repeats in this gene, about 90% repetitive DNA. So that's probably the crop just secure to survive, you know. Any mutation happens, there are repeats everywhere. Mutation happens, no problem. I have the repeats. Uh, so no threat. So that might be the main reason. Actually, no, we are on the pan genomes now because, of course, when you have the genome, you want to just look at the genome diversity. Uh, Professor Alan Schulman uh, is taking care of that. So we choose five lines initially. I'll be 938. We love this line coming from Colombia, Ecuador, reported. Even I published a paper to I'll be 938, a valuable follow uh, section because it really is a source for everything. There's a single line, it's a source for drought, chuck spot, every disease as we know. Uh, and have very fantastic small Thai uh, crop. Uh, so they're yeah, very energy efficient. That's probably why I keep, keep the crop small and then anyway, shut the stomata closed sometimes. Very, I mean, smart stomatal function. So we have this melody because it's the source of low voicing con voicing coming from this French Indra breeding line, I mean, breeding program. We have one, uh, these dwarf land races and we have this Chinese line, which is very uh, early, you see, this is actually in this picture down, you see, this is the Finnish. Finnish favorites are among the earliest, but even this Chinese one is earlier than the Finnish one. And we have one winter beans because also we have winter fava beans, which going to be perfect, going to be perfect for, for climate, probably, I don't know. Actually, my, our colleagues are adding more lines because we need more diversity, 20 more lines for to be sequenced. And here actually you can see the structure of fava bean genetic diversity, so we decided to Kind of we got this, try to maximize the diversity. Uh, how when we picked that, we, we didn't have these when actually we choosing the lines, but anyway, I think it was not, it's good actually. We have very far lines, I mean, genetically very far from each other. And actually, what I call this Fabobin genomic and breeding toolbox. So, our toolbox is almost completed now. So, we have the reference genome, we're getting a better version of reference genome. My good colleague. Uh, Professor Donald O'Sullivan at the University of Reading has developed his 40, uh, 60K SNP chip array. Fantastic. Uh, Stig Anderson, uh, Professor Stig and Dix Anderson, I mean, yeah, at the University of Aarhus, they have these SPET genotyping 90K props. They have uh, lots of nice mutation, actually, lines across, I mean, the world. We have developed speed breeding protocol. We have nice phenotyping tools. Genome, genomic selection is going on and we have made a lot of crosses. We have rich genomic resources. So we are trying to include gene editing, which is in progress and tissue culture into our toolbox. Yeah, that's all. I hope I did it on time. Yeah. Yes. I was happy you. to take questions. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Habib. And uh, please post your questions in the chat. Uh, let me check here. Um, yes, we have a question from Patrick asking, have low visine, convisine types become the standard for new cultivars? Yeah, I do. Of course. Yeah, they are. There's only, uh, as long as we know, there's only one source because we did a huge genetic diversity, I mean, genetic and phenotypic diversity for visine, convisine. And we know all coming from one line, which is a, a Polish line, actually. And they're all carrying the same gene. We call it VC minus or VC1. Yeah. So I think you can get the source. That's a single gene. You can simply make the cross and then segregation population, you should get 25% low visine on visine in your adapted lines. Yeah, the sources are available. We would be happy to share if anybody needs a source. I was wondering, uh, follow up on that question, is what what is the role of the bison in, in the seed? And when you eliminate, would you have any secondary or? Yeah. That's a very good question. That's actually, that's riboflowing, you know? So the way is, uh, because we cannot fully 
block the pathway because, you know, we have this riboflavin pathway involved in this and plants need riboflavin. There might be something with plant defense, but to be honest, we did many, and there are many reports that we couldn't find any, any, any clear role for the vicin con vicin in the plants. So there are many people, many groups are working on that, but there is no clear answer. We don't know, to be honest. It might so, be just their evolutionary something that we don't know. Um, question from Leonardo, uh, having chromosome one so big, do you find having inside this chromosome a lot of genes and QTLs about all the, the other chromosomes or not? That's correct. That's a good question. Yes. Most of the genes we have already detected for drought, I mean, for chocolate spot, for tannins, or many other traits, they are all located in chromosome one. So, actually, the, the thing that makes it more interesting is all at the beginning of the chromosome. There's a huge, actually, overlap there. So, but anyway, we are at the early I mean, stage of this crop. Maybe we do more and we find more. We don't know. That's all an orphan crop still, you know. And what I'm talking is based what we know so far. Yeah. Okay. Matthias is asking if you are using magic populations for fine QTL mapping. And if yes, which statistical methods do you use to analyze it? Mm, good question. Uh, for magic uh, populations, uh, we um, of course we use it for point mapping. Uh, we all we just use this association mapping. That's how we do basically. That's uh, we have good bioinformatician teams, but I'm not a bioinformatician. But I do with the students I have. We are, all, we are happy with association mapping because uh, if big QTLs pop up, I mean they're happy. Yeah. Um. Hela is asking that uh, it's, uh, you have mentioned that fava bean genome has a lot of repeats. Any explanations for that? I was trying to explain somehow. That's very complicated. I think that's something evolutionary because that's a very that's a very old crop, you know. Uh, so uh, many of my colleagues believe that that's a way to survive, you know, to have a lot of repeats. Then you get a mutation. Then you still have a good DNA to survive, you know, and then to kind of avoid, you know. Uh, to to, I mean, little mutation. That might that might be one explanation. So as I mentioned, things are very new. We don't know much about that yet. Yeah. That would be my explanation for now. I would Sergio, be happy with something if somebody can contribute in this. Yeah. <laughs> Sergio is asking with which sequencing strategy are you, or platform are you building your fababin pan genome? Uh, Hi-Fi, Hi-Fi long reads. Uh, we use Hi-Fi. We need the long reads because huge genome. You know. So I think nobody uses uh, short reads anymore. I mean, you know, of course, we use this for some purpose, but for pen genome, for genome, we use Hi-Fi, and also we, we use yeah Hi-Fi long reads from PacBio. We get service from PacBio. Okay, so Samuel is asking, do you have any insight into pangenome methods and actually implementing into a breeding program? For example, the pangenome graphs, the novel or reference base, or just directly comparing genome to genome? Yes, that's a good question. Very good question. For following, we're going to have problem. I wish my colleague, Professor Alan Schulman, was here to explain in a better way. Uh, so because the genome and the chromosome is very huge, we're going to have problem with the pan, I mean, with the pan genome graphs. So we are already facing that issue. But I mean, the, our aim, of course, is to make a good biological usage out of the pan genome. And then uh, yeah, we have made, a, I mean, we have made nested association mapping panels using the pan genome. Uh, so I'm trying to sequence them and use, make a good use out of the pan genome. Yeah. But uh, the good question, I think we're going to have problem not problem. We have good bioinformaticians working on that, but it's going to be more challenging to make the pan genome graphs for this crop, because pan genome was mostly done with a crop with smaller genome, not this huge, especially chromosome one. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We are going to do it based, uh, I mean gene based. That's but we may miss something. But eh, let's see. Um, my question is: You mentioned in one of the corners of your toolbox. Hybrid breeding, uh, are there hybrid cultivars in the market, uh, maybe in no. China or somewhere? And uh, be interested to uh, hear what the strategy is at the CMS base, I imagine? Yeah, there has been some progress in Germany. That's why I put it there. So one of my colleagues are working on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
Professor Wolfgang Link, I think he's the best in this, I mean, top of inbreeding methodology. So they have done it, but still, I think uh, we are facing issues. It's there, but it's not commercially available, to be honest. Okay. China, we don't know much, to be honest. We don't, they don't share much information with us. Uh, we are not in touch with the Chinese groups, unfortunately. It's the largest producing country, isn't it? Yes, you're right. That's the largest. Mm -hmm. uh, Okay. Any other questions, please post in the chat. Um, you mentioned, uh, Fab, are there products in the market right now that are um, plant-based uh, alternative protein products uh, for human consumption based on fava beans or not? Yeah, there are many. There are? Okay. There are actually, this, uh, what's this company based in California? There, there have been a lot of meetings there. Just probably don't bring the names anyway. Yeah, there, there are a lot of big companies in California, California based. I mean, okay. companies are interested in already following, so they're going to, yeah, they're looking for buying the products now. But the problem is there's not enough products, you know. Okay, uh, I mean, do, I you, mean it, yeah. Yeah. do you think that this vaccine, uh, although you're promoting for this type of products, low vaccine uh, cultivars. But the fact that you have, in general, the association between this bicene and health problems, do you think that will be a deterrent for people to uh, to buy products? Because you have the case of peanuts uh, here in the mm -hmm. U.S. It's, it's an excellent source of protein. It could be amazingly yeah. used, and that's but the fact that some people is I'm allergic, e yeah, I can, I'm allergic. E even 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 if you develop low allergenic that's lines, good. they will still it will be there in their minds of the consumers. Thank you, Carlos. That's a very good question you ask because that's a concern of many, I mean, our colleagues, I mean, food scientist colleagues. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the way we are working, for example, the way we did in Canada, we are going to have some legislation. So all the farmers only should grow low vaccine from vice. So the way we are doing also in Europe. So we are encouraging farmers to only grow low vaccine. We don't get any contaminations because this crop is doing a lot of outcrossing. So if you have the legislation in your state or your area, people only grow low vaccine from vaccine. And there are a lot of clinical studies out now that are showing if you have low vaccine from vaccine is not harmful. It doesn't kill anybody anymore. So I, I can say, I don't remember the papers, but there are some very good journal, I mean, paper published in Lancet. Uh, and then they're increasing the number of the patients and then uh, patients and then doing more. But, uh, because you are not going to use 100% fababin protein, am I right? You're going to mix it with something. So in that case, it's going to be, some of our colleagues in Germany also did it. So there's zero harm to people actually having that deficiency, G6PD. So uh, we, I don't want to say something here, it's getting recorded, but most likely okay. it's going to be very safe for people because I'm, okay. I'm a breeder, I'm not, <laughs> I cannot give any, anyway, you know what I'm saying, but it, it should be fine. Low vaccine and vaccine should be fine, basically. And actually we are working, uh, Professor Alan Schulman groups, uh, Alan Schulman groups is working on it. So we are going to 100% actually remove on vaccine and vaccine now. Yeah, we can, we are making 100% removal. That's the I have a question from Garland here. She's interested in these seeds that you're showing right now. Is that genetic or uh, no. is that disease? Seed people, seed people just moving around the pots. Yeah. No, not that genetics. No. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> oh, look nice. <laughs> Before we thought that's genetics, but then we noticed that. At first, I thought that if we, when you see it somewhere, they're trying to sell it to you, it's not genetic. So probably some insects getting into the pot, and then that's a the print, <laughs> oh, insect okay. prints. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, I'm going to request your screen, um, the screen uh, from you, see if I can get it. Can you, can you stop sharing, please? Yeah, of course. Thank you. Any other questions, uh, please? Um, and Gala said that she wouldn't have guessed that uh, it was an insect. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Hamid. Um, let me share the screen here. Okay. Okay. So this is the last seminar for this series, uh, for the fall series of 2023. Thank you so much for uh, the participation of everybody in this series. And we look forward to have you back as uh, uh, participants 
in the next uh, seminar series, which starts uh, the 28th of March. We already have a speaker lined up for that day. So uh, thank you so much for your attendance. Thank you, Hamid. It's great presentation, great learnings about fava beans. Thanks to the help of Brandon and Tiago that helped me put this seminar uh, uh, every every semester. And thank you everybody for attending. I, I, I hope uh, you guys have a good end of the year and a good uh, winter break and that uh, we start 2024 in good shape. And we'll see you in 2024. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Hamid.